like Professors Schiller and Zadio, I'm an economist, but I'm going to tell you about three new scientific ideas from Yale. So these are endophytes seen here growing in culture. Endophytes are microorganisms that live on the, in the inside of plants symbiotically. And th there are probably about a million species of endophytes, and we only have identified about 20% of them. The other 80% we've never isolated, identified, and we don't know their properties. This is going to be an example of how teaching and research can combine in a great university. Scott Strobel is a professor of biology at Yale, and he teaches a course that, uh, about endophytes that runs from the beginning of the spring semester in January all the way through the summer. A student has to sign up to work in a lab all summer. During the spring break in March, they go to a rainforest and gather plants and bring them back, and they, and they uh, find the endophytes in those plants and, and isolate them to run their DNA, sequence the DNA, and test their properties. This is a typical student's yield. A typical student wound up with about 40 endophytes that then they ran tests on. Now, what, what can endophytes do? We know that some of them are antibiotics, but Priya Anand wanted to know if endophytes could, de if they could find one that would degrade plastics. Well, lo and behold, out of 40 specimens, she found one. Two other students the next year went back and looked for plants like the ones Priya had found, things that physically resembled the plant, and they came back and found better ones. Here's what happened. Here's what they tested. Here's polyurethane in solution. Chlororaphus, P. chlororaphus, is a known bacterium that actually has some degrading properties. Of that, that just this little bit is degraded. Look at what happens with these endophytes. Five of them we found. All of them, to a four of them, are better, and one completely eliminates the polyurethane. Now, another discovery we'll move to is it relates to the human genome. We had this great breakthrough of sequencing the entire human genome and the promise of personalized medicine that we can find cures for individual people because of their genetic defects. But it's really hard to do that because the genome is so long and contains so much information, it's hard to process. But the exome is the 1% of the DNA that contains the known genes. The other 99% of DNA is junk. So what the, uh, the idea is to sort of isolate the exome through sequencing and then see if you can use that information uh, to, to find out uh, uh, more about disease. Rick Lifton, professor at Yale, uh, developed a technique for, I, for the first person to actually be able to sequence only the exome. You chop up the DNA and you take only these pieces that are known genes, you put them onto a chip, you wash them, and you sequence just, tho just those 1% of your DNA. And that's the way, and then, then you find clues. Now here's the first successful example of personalized medicine from Yale. Umet was a severely ill five-month-old Turkish male who was suffering from terrible dehydration. Notice he's inbred. We've got, we got all these intersecting lines here. This is a genetic chart. Two siblings died in utero, one in childbirth, and he was five months old. What was going on? Well, he was, we, Lifton ran his technique, and what did he found? He found that there was one uh, 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 difference, a G, instead of a G in the normal case, he had an A in the uh, nucleotide, which synthesized, which, uh, which created an amino acid N instead of D. Notice all the known species for which we know the genetic sequence um, actually had been, we, we, they figured out what was wrong and cured the, the young man. Now, third discovery. Um, what's the future of computing? We know that we've doubled processing speed every, every two years for, for 30 or 40 years. That's going to run out because as we shrink circuit elements, we get to an atomic scale. And the laws of physics take different laws of physics. Quantum mechanics takes over, not normal Newtonian physics. And so what we've got scientists at Yale working on developing computers that are based on the quantum principles that a single atom can be in two states, zero and one, and sometimes in the same state, at the, in both states, simultaneously. It's really hard to build, to wire atoms into a computer, but we've done it. Rob Sholkoff and Michelle Devoray have built a quantum processor on a chip that uses, that, that uses art, artificial atoms, and it makes the fir world's first quantum computer two bits. It's really small, but it's a start, and it's a very important start. Here's, what quantum here's how quantum computers can work. And a normal question is, where's the red card? Classical computer search would take two and a quarter guesses on average to find the, the red card. Because of the properties of quantum computing, Actually, you can peek simultaneously under all the cards at the same time, and it takes much less time in one try. What's the future? What are the applications for which quantum computing will be important? For one thing, it'll find prime factors 
which is an important thing of numbers, which is an important aspect of cryptography in unbelievably fast time. Look at the difference. And, and th in many other areas, there are amazing possibilities for applications. But you know, one thing is certain, we don't know what the applications will be because every time there are breakthroughs of this magnitude, the, there are serendipitous discoveries. When the laser was invented, who knew it was going to be used for eye surgery? 